What does Jesus mean by saying, then what will happen if you see the Son of Man ascend to where he was before? Well, uh, this is a statement from John, I believe John chapter 6, uh, responding to the disciples uh, when the uh, people who had followed him, the multitude who had ate the loaves and fris fishes, deserted Jesus because he began talking about uh, the Father choosing those who would believe. Uh, and then the disciples are like, thinking this is hard language, eat his flesh and drink his blood. Uh, and so uh, Jesus' statement here is a clear allusion to his pre-existence, where he was, meaning where he existed before, uh, obviously before his birth. And so uh, I don't think the Son of Man is a human title. I think it's a divine title. I think Daniel chapter 7 makes that very clear because uh, I don't have a category, at least biblically, for uh, creatures that receive worship. I don't buy that. And the language there, especially in the Septuagint, is religious worship, religious devotion. The verb there is latreo. Um, so, yeah, I don't know much, what more I can say about that. Yep, thank you. Well, yes, uh, John 6, actually, it's John, uh, let, let's see, where are we here? 662, I believe. What then if you see the Son of Man ascending to where he's, he was before? So this whole uh, teaching is very difficult. And the reason we know it's very difficult because everyone left Jesus. Well, almost everyone. <laughs> um, it says that only the 12 remained and then Jesus looked at them and said, are you guys living too? It's uh, Jesus makes, makes a contrast here with his flesh and the bread, the manna in the Old Testament during the desert sojourn. Uh, God um, gave them something to eat. So Jesus is equating, he's comparing his flesh with that uh, living bread, as he calls it. And that bread is said to have come down from heaven. Now, if you go back to the Old Testament story, the bread didn't literally come down out of heaven. It just appeared, I believe, uh, on the ground, if you read the account. Jesus is that son of man figure. If you want to look at this in, in terms of the vision in Daniel 7 of, of the human person there, the human being glorified, obviously, then you can look at it that way. So he's the one there that was before, perhaps. But to read this literally, then you would have to um, assume, I guess, that he pre-existed in the flesh. That's not what Michael believes, obviously, or Trinitarians. Uh, but yes, to give this a too literal meaning, I think it's problematic for both our camps, for the Trinitarian and the non-Trinitarian. John 6, how was, quote, his flesh in heaven before he was born? Uh, yeah, it wasn't, uh, clearly. Um, I think when you read the Gospels, given that the birth of Christ is in the beginning of the Gospels, or at least it's implied in John's Gospel, uh, you're to assume in incarnation, because that's what those passages teach. And so uh, to read the incarnation back into preexistence is foolish, and I don't know why anyone would do that. Uh, to say, well, if he came down from heaven, that would mean his flesh. If you're going to take that literally, no, uh, that would be reading your theology back into the passage. Uh, rather, a much easier way uh, would be to read it in context with the rest of John, where Jesus says things like in John 8, uh, I saw things with the Father. Well, when did he see things with the Father? Uh, he literally claims there, I saw things in the presence of the Father. Well, uh, does that mean his flesh was in heaven with God? No, it means he pre-existed apart from his human existence. Yes, I actually, I agree with a lot of that. Um, obviously, it's not uh, talking literally there in John 6. Um, how Jesus knows things uh, and how he can speak of um, heavenly things. And well, because he's the man from heaven. Uh, I don't think literally he's a man from heaven or else, again, both our camps would agree that a human being was not up there and literally came down. It says his flesh is the bread that came down out of heaven. So his flesh is the bread. Uh, it, obviously not to be read literally. These are spiritual things, spiritual matters. He's the, Jesus is the one who has the, the clearest access, let's call it, to God the Father in heaven. And I think that's that's the meaning then obviously a spiritual spiritual meaning, not literally. 
Why would the Son have to be appointed an heir of all things if he already is God to whom all things belong as creator? Uh, yeah, well, it's a classic uh, subordinationist question or objection. Um, as I mentioned, uh, the Son of God became incarnate and thus took upon himself a great humiliation, and in fact, an infinite humiliation if you think about it, uh, whereby he did engage in a kind of self-emptying. Uh, the emptying was taking upon himself uh, the limitations of human existence. It's a little counterintuitive, but uh, that's what Paul says in Philippians 2. He took upon himself uh, the form of a slave being born in the likeness of men. Uh, those two participles explain what is meant by the verb kanao, to empty. And so, uh, well, when you're humiliated, uh, or you humiliate yourself in this case, uh, you can be exalted thereafter. And so that's how we account. We account for Jesus's exaltation because he became incarnate to be our savior. Uh, and, um, you know, the Bible speaks of this exaltation constantly. John 17, 5, where Jesus petitions the father for the glory he had before the world existed. I think it's confusing when we're speaking about the son of God and Jesus or Jesus Christ, to me anyway, what I have read from the patristics, from the creeds, uh, the councils, is that, and and this is today, I hear many Trinitarians say that, well, when it says Jesus or it's referring to the Christ, it's his human nature, as to his human nature. But when it's the Son of God, is as to his divine nature, because obviously the Son of God took on flesh in the womb, as far as I understand the creed. So the question here, why would the son have to be appointed heir of all things, is coming from that point of view. Trinitarian orthodoxy, as far as I understand it, claims that the son of God is that divine God the son that uh, came down and so on. So when scripture talks, this has the son of God as the subject, as Mark 13, 32 has, the son does not know that they are the hour. Well, either he knows it or doesn't know it, and if we go to incarnation uh, orthodox trinitarian view then that's not what it's saying the, it's not saying the son as a human did not know the son as a human originated in the womb or came to be in the womb so that's the conflict uh, about reading the bible the new testament things it says about the son of god dying romans 5 10 as i pointed out and then when we ask the question, which is a legitimate question in my mind, how then can we explain that? And to revert to, uh, I believe Michael uh, said something interesting that he doesn't distinguish between human or divine nature when he reads the scriptures. I agree, Michael, we shouldn't distinguish. Jesus Christ is the one and the same person of the Son of God. Says Michael, I'm a Trinitarian. You said that Christ didn't have all knowledge. You also said that you don't separate his natures. How aren't you doing this by saying that he didn't have all knowledge? Uh, yeah, good question. <clears throat> and so uh, when I say we don't separate the natures of Christ, what I'm saying is we don't make him into two persons. That is a divine person, you know, God the Son, and then a human person, the Son of God. Uh, that's what I meant by uh, we don't separate the persons or his or separate his natures into two persons. Um, clearly, uh, I don't know how anyone would argue otherwise. Jesus was ignorant about all manner of things. Um, the Bible says he learned obedience. Uh, clearly, he had to you know learn to live. I mean, he was nursing at his mother's breast. He was an authentic human being. And so obviously he didn't have all knowledge because he has taken upon himself a humiliation, taking upon himself all that it means to be human. And so naturally, uh, as one, uh, you know, one person who is both God and man, uh, subjecting himself to all of these uh, conventions of creation, naturally he wouldn't have all knowledge. Yeah, again, we're, we're back to square one. Uh, Christ is the Son of God. The Son of God is Christ. There's no distinction in Scripture. Uh, Michael is right. When we read the New Testament, we shouldn't, you know, split up the Son of God or the Christ. Uh, so uh, the natures, uh, I, again, I, as far as I understand my, my history of the creeds, he's two natures, but the natures do not mix. Uh, they don't conflict. 
it's one person in two natures and so on. He's called the God man. Again, there's no such terms or teaching in, 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 in the whole of the Bible that the son of God, the Messiah in the Old Testament was to be a, a hybrid, really what I think is a hybrid God man, double nature uh, person. It's not found in, in, the, in the ancient rabbis, as far as I know. It's not found, obviously, in the New Testament. Yes, we, we should not uh, try and read the accounts of, of the Messiah, the Son of God, with this sort of lens uh, of, of chalcedon over our eyes. It's very difficult. If the Son became a genuine human being, then how is he God? Each human being that exists today is a genuine human being, but not God. Yeah, well, clearly Jesus is unique in some senses. I mean, he had a virgin birth. Uh, there were angels. You know, the heavenly host was uh, singing his praises. Uh, there were king kingmakers coming to visit him. So he isn't completely ordinary. Um, but when we say he became man, we don't mean that he divested himself of his deity or stopped being uh, the, the son of God. What we mean is that he took upon himself uh, in incarnation, a, a human existence. And the passage to look at would be, well, the prologue of John and, uh, and the Carmen Christi in Philippians 2. These would be the two passages that would be particularly helpful uh, to describe the incarnation. So we're not saying he stopped being God to become man. That would be the canonic heresy. Uh, we're saying that one who was fully divine took upon himself humanity and lived that way in obedience to God because he was born of woman, born under law, but he was sent forth from God. Yes, again, we're, we're back to double nature. How is he God if he's, if he's human? Yes, that's the eternal question. The thing about John 1, just quickly, the prologue of John 1, the word of God, the word of God is never a person distinct, separate from God the Father, also known as Yahweh, or Jehovah, by the by the way, doesn't matter how you pronounce the divine name, the four letters, if you want to say, that there's no such uh, issue in, in the Old Testament. So the word of God is simply the word of God, his self-expression. It's a quality of God. Wisdom was with God, it says, Proverbs 8 and 9. So these are qualities of God. They should not be confused with an actual separate distinct person. Again, you the only place uh, you get that is in the creeds, Nicaea, Chalcedon, and forward. These so-called Athanasian creed, whose um, date, by the way, is unknown. It could be as late as 1000 AD. The first Trinitarian creed official of the church. That's how late it is. Check out any dictionary commentary. They don't know the date. But as far as the so-called ecumenical official uh, councils, there is no Trinitarian creed until that so-called Athanasian creed and the double nature issue of uh, 451 at Chalcedon. And when that pops up, uh, we get all these issues and all these questions. The same tune there. Uh, you said that Jesus is a human person, but your creeds say that he is man, but not a man. Do you agree that Jesus is not a man? Um, I'm not familiar with the whatever creed is under consideration. Um, the creeds that I hold to are the standard ecumenical ones, uh, Nicaea in both 325 and 381, Chalcedon, the Athanasian Creed, and the Apostles' Creed. And to suggest that uh, the Athanasian Creed could have been, you know, originated in 1000 AD is absolutely indefensible. Uh, because we have extant old Latin manuscripts that predate that. So I don't know where uh, he got that from. Uh, and so uh, I don't know what the difference would be between a man and a man. Uh, Jesus was authentically human. I mean, I don't know how many times I have to say that. Um, he's a genuine human being. Yes, the Athanasian Creed of Lutheran Church says it's uh, late. As late as a thousand, uh, history books will say that the Catholic Church, the nascent early Catholic Church, adopted it. The popes adopted it in 1000, I believe, 1000 or 1100 AD. But anyway, that's a matter of history. You can check it out. Don't believe any of us. Quickly about the question, uh, just a quote here, to know and follow Jesus by heart, uh, the author Hart. The Council of Chalcedon tells us that Jesus is called man in the generic sense, but not a man. He has human nature, but he's not a human person. 
I believe that's where the question is coming from. The person in him is the second person of the Blessed Trinity, a.k.a. God the Son. Jesus does not have a human personal center. This is how the council gets around the possible problem of split personality. Again, as far as I know, my history and uh, the, the commentary by some uh, modern day evangelicals and others, you should not say that he is a person. They already believe that God the Son is the only person in the equation. So God the Son, the divine person, took on a human nature only, not a obviously a human person. That's two persons. And I can see the problem there. So strictly speaking, uh, orthodox uh, incarnational theory uh, would posit that uh, Jesus is man, generic man, humanity, but not a man that is a human person. So um, adoptionism is what is under consideration in that relevant portion. Um, and you're mixing categories there because when we say that he took upon himself a human nature, uh, that includes all that it means to be human. And so naturally, uh, he's the human person, right? There isn't another human person who's the son of God that he became. Uh, he didn't adopt a pre-existing person and become that. No, he's the human person. So to boil it down and say it's just a nature, yeah, but nature includes personhood, right? You can't have a human nature that's not personal, right? So... Uh, um, here's one for you as well. How would you respond to the following John 1:14, where it says the word became flesh? It does not say the word took on flesh, which is the Trinitarian reading. Uh, well, I would say there's an arbitrary distinction being made that would have to be substantiated between taking on flesh and becoming flesh. Um, the notion that the word isn't personal is absolutely also indefensible because the word is God. If God is personal, the word is personal necessarily, unless you want to have a non-personal God like, you know, Shia Muslims and some forms of Eastern religion. If God is personal, the word is necessarily personal because the word is God. And the word is also distinct from God. That's made very clear in verse two of the prologue of John. He was in the beginning with God. And we can go to the pronouns. Um, I've heard things Carlos has said with regard uh, to the pronouns there being, should be rendered it in the uh, vein of his father-in-law, but that also is absolutely ludicrous. Uh, so the word who is God, the son became a human being. If you want to say he took on flesh, I mean the same thing. You know, they're synonymous phrases. Uh, yes, the pronoun there, he was in the beginning and so on. It, it can be translated it and it was before the King James, all English translations before then from the Greek, mind you, by the early Protestants had it, it was in the beginning and so on. Uh, biological gender should not be confused with grammatical gender. In other words, I'm Spanish and we call a car a he, but it's a car, right? Uh, and the reason we know this about the logos, the word of God is first John one, which is the commentary by John himself, not Anthony Buzzard or, or Carlos or Michael, John himself calls there the word of God, the word of life, same subject, unless unless uh, you say it's a different word, different logos, a what, a which was in the beginning, what we have seen. That's not a who, clear Greek right there. All translations, as far as I know, have what or which, never a who, never a he, the word of life, the word of God, never a person, check it out, it's a, uh, personified to say the least in the prologue of John. It's personified to say the very least in the Old Testament. We only have a, a couple of places where it talks about the word of God. By the word of God, the heavens were created and so on. But as we know from normal English grammar and Spanish grammar, a personification is not an actual person. So Michael, who is the God of Jesus? And shouldn't his followers have the same God as he to make us true followers? Was the God of Jesus a trinity? Yeah, well, the question uh, assumes Unitarianism from the outset. So obviously, I don't hold that view. The God of Jesus, with regard to, say, the prologue of Hebrews, is clearly the Father. But then again, the Father says Jesus is God. So I, I don't know why we would isolate and say, who's the God of Jesus? Uh, Jesus is clearly called God numerous times. Not only is he called God by Paul, 
Uh, for instance, in Galatians 1, he was receptive of his gospel, not from man, but from Jesus Christ. Uh, Paul says that Christ is our great God and Savior. Uh, we can look at other places where Jesus is called God. Obviously, Thomas's response uh, to Jesus, to the resurrected Lord, my Lord and my God. Uh, so clearly, he's also God. Um, and uh, it's a little bit of a subjective question. And shouldn't his followers have the same God? Well, yeah, sure. Sure they should. Uh, no one is saying to worship Christ in isolation from the Father and Holy Spirit. Um so, yeah, there's a lot there that I don't hold. Yes, the uh, God of Jesus is the God of the Son as well. Second uh, John 3, God is the Father, Jesus the Son of the Father. I appreciate the fact that Michael is not making any kind of uh, distinctions regarding uh, the title Messiah with the title Son of God. It's the same, one in the same person, so I appreciate that. Um, there's a passage, I believe, I was trying to remember in John 8, where uh, Jesus, going at it again with his fellow Pharisees, says, uh, you guys followed the devil. And then they they out, outrage and say, no, no, we followed the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. I'm paraphrasing. And then Jesus says, well, if you knew him, God, the Father, he's your God, he's my God. The God of Jesus, the God of the Son of God, has never changed. The God of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Moses, Jesus. The, who is the son of God. So it's the same God We're, we are trying in our different ways. I, I can appreciate that, Michael. We're trying to follow that same one God, but it's clear, the, the, the New Testament is clear. Paul is clear in 1 Corinthians 8, 6. We Christians have one God, the Father, not one God, Father and Son, let alone one God, Father, Son and Holy Spirit. 1 Corinthians 8, 6, we have one God, the Father. Did Jeremiah pre-exist because Yahweh knew him before the womb and also knew Paul before the womb, etc.? No, but that is a uh, an illegitimate comparison because um, the New Testament never says right uh, that all things were created through Paul. It never says that. It never says that Paul laid the foundation of the earth and the heavens were stretched out by his hands. So not exactly uh, an equal comparison. And um, when we talk about uh, pre-existence, uh, we're not talking about idealized pre-existence. You could say, you know, maybe Jeremiah had an idealized pre-existence, meaning uh, there was a sense in which he was loved in the mind of God. Uh, but that is not the kind of language you ever find with the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for example, uh, you know, Carlos said something about, you know, Creation was for the Son. That's how we explain Hebrews 1-2. Uh, or on account of the Son. That would actually be a different grammatical construction. That would be deal with the accusative, not deal with the genitive. Um, so when we talk about the pre-existence of the Son of God, we're talking about actual pre-existence. And uh, we have places in the Old Testament where the Father speaks to the Son, the Son speaks to the Father, and so forth. Father refers to the Son in a third person. Uh, where the angel of Yahweh, who is identified in one pericope as Yahweh, speaks of Yahweh and to Yahweh, where God speaks of the uh, angel of Yahweh in the third person and calls him God. So a um, little bit different than what we have in terms of Jeremiah and Paul. Yeah, th uh, thank you. Let's talk about it, pre-existence. There is idealized uh, pre-existence teaching in the ancient rabbis. I got a, a couple of quotes here. Seven things were created before the world was made. This is Peshitta. Uh, one of the Peshitas, uh, they are Torah, the Garden of Eden, Gehenna, the Throne of Glory, House of Sanctuary, and the name of the Messiah. Check it out. Uh, a Targum, the Targum of Zechariah, Targums is a commentaries, a rabbinical commentaries of the Old Testament. On Zechariah 4, God will reveal his Messiah whose name is spoken from the beginning whose name is spoken from the beginning. I, I mean, I got a whole list here. There is uh, idealized so-called pre-existence regarding believers in the New Testament. Uh, Romans 8, those he foreknew, he predestined, he has called, he has justified, he has glorified. That's Romans 8. Uh, Galatians 1, even Paul. When God, who had set me apart from my mother's womb, 
obviously idealized. So there is rabbinical precedence for this, Jewish precedence, Old Testament precedence, New Testament precedence for an idealized type, if you want to call it that. In John 16, 30 and John 21, 17, it states that Christ knows all things. In First yes. John 3, 20, John says that only God knows all things. Is this not an identification that Christ is God? Yes, uh, we know that Jesus does not know all things. Mark 13, 32, the Son of God does not know the day or the hour. John 16, yes, uh, Christ knows all things in terms of whatever things the context dictates. I don't know what the context is there. Uh, but obviously the son does not know the day or the hour. Sometimes Jesus doesn't know who touched him. I believe there's an incident where a woman touches him and he says, who touched me? Who grabbed me? So obviously we have to see the old things in context. Uh, sometimes all things doesn't mean all things. Yes, so he only knows whatever he knows in the terms of the context of, of the passage you're citing. And uh, yeah. uh, I don't I don't disagree. I think that's exactly right. I think when you string along proof texts like John 1630, John 21, and 1 John 320, um, that's not actual exegesis. That's not an exposition of what those passages say. That's just saying this one says this. Here's another one says something like that. Put them together, and now I have a doctrine. Uh, that is not how systematic theology works. That's not how biblical exegesis works, and we should stay away from that as Trinitarians. That's not something we want to do. And historically, that's not something the church is really into. Uh, rather, when we give a prolonged, careful consideration of the Gospel of John, it is very obvious. In fact, this is a unanimous claim of biblical scholarship, even liberal scholarship, that the Son of God pre-exists in John. It is clear, it is obvious, it is palpable, and... Um, you know, there's not much. There's a lot of appeal to different scholars and things. I try not to do that because a lot of that is a fallacious appeal to authority. But it is very clear in all extant biblical scholarship that the Son of God preexists and not merely as wisdom or some idealized preexistence. Even the most hardened, uh, you know, uh, champion of idealized preexistence, which is uh, James Dunn, says clearly Jesus Christ as a person preexisted in John. He would attribute that to the liturgical development in John's late date, which I don't hold. But, you know, and so when, when you even have people like that saying it, it is obvious. Anyone, even a child could read the Gospel of John and see that Jesus obviously did not begin to exist in the womb of Mary as a human being. James Dunn, yes, we, we quote James Dunn a lot, true. Uh, we have to be careful with James Dunn. He's the one who introduced the so-called splitting the Shema in the 70s. I believe he, he was in his book, uh, Unity and Diversity, and then uh, Christology in the Making, 1980. So the idea for, for our viewers that in 1 uh, Corinthians 8, Paul is splitting the Shema. In other words, he's alluding to the Shema. There is one God, the Father, and one Lord Jesus, and so on. So Don may popularize that, and everyone else took it up, anti Wright, Balkum, and, and so on. I would appeal to the viewer to be careful with that scholar who died recently, by the way, so uh, I don't want to speak ill of the dead, but uh, be careful with him. He, uh, one of his last books, did, Jesus, uh, did the first Christians worship Jesus? He actually takes back splitting the Shema. He said, oh, maybe this is not the way to read that. Maybe there's an alternative way. Again, check out uh, the book, uh, Don't Believe Me. Uh, his student, uh, James McGrath, who's, who's a professor in his own right, Dr. James McGrath, agrees with James Dunn for whatever it's worth. But again, uh, I agree with you, Michael. We're not playing ping pong scholars here. Uh, but just as an alternative to that, uh, I would appeal for you to carefully examine. Uh, Dunn, by the way, does agree that there is wisdom literature, so-called, in the prologue of John 1. He does appeal to that. He does talk about the, the Word of God being a self-expression of God the Father himself as well. So I'm, I'm just pleading for to be careful. Hey, can I just say one thing with regard sure. to this? Um, yeah, so um, I wouldn't call it splitting the Shema. Uh, but uh, there is evidence in patristic writers that they saw the Shema in 1 Corinthians 8. So that's not something that started. Which I, done. Which I agree. Which I agree. Yeah, that's not. So that's not right. a convention of done. And I would argue that it was actually Wright who presented the most fully orbed explanation of that in 
uh, the climax of the covenant, which I believe is it might be earlier than Christianity in the making. I'm not sure, but early nineties. And I agree. Michael, what scripture supports the idea that a pre-human Jesus entered Mary's womb and came out a baby? Um, well, uh, there's a bunch of passages one could uh, go to to establish that. Uh, probably, um, probably. well, let's stick with Hebrews because I was talking about Hebrews earlier. Um, if we look at Hebrews, uh, let's see. Hebrews 10, 5. Uh, Consequently, when Christ came into the world, he said, sacrifices and offerings you have not desired, but a body you've prepared for me. Um, the verb there is uh, ice erkamai. Uh, it's actually the, the participial form of that, ice, uh, ice erkamenos. Uh, it's a present active participle there, meaning that Christ said these things not when he was in the womb, but as he was transitioning, when meaning the incarnation had become complete at that point. And so, you know, I, there's a good example of that. Um, yes, um, on Hebrews uh, 10 scripture there, I would appeal to the context. It goes on to say in verse 9, Luke, I have come to do your will. He canceled, he, Christ, canceled the first covenant, the old covenant of Moses, in order to put the second into effect. Verse 10. For God's will was for us to be made holy by the sacrifice of the body of the Messiah, Jesus, once for all time. So God prepared a human sacrifice, his own son. Again, the son of God, folks. He suffered. He died for you. Uh, the results of which removed that old covenant Levitical system that the uh, the writer in Hebrews uh, so much details. And I would appeal, uh, again, I don't want to play uh, ping pong scholars here, and I appreciate Michael not doing the same, but F.F. Uh, Bruce, the noted F.F. Uh, Bruce in his epistle to the Hebrews, and, and others, I believe, uh, rightly uh, see the this alternative interpretation of, of how we should look at uh, God preparing a body, and it has to do, obviously, with the context of a sacrificial body, the body of the Son of God, who is obviously the Messiah. You say the Father is Yahweh, the Son is Yahweh, and the Spirit is Yahweh. How many Yahwehs are there? Uh, yeah, so uh, Sir Anthony Buzzard asked me this question uh, when I was a Bible college student in 2010, I think it was. Um, and uh, my answer is still the same. Uh, I am a slave to scripture, and I have to uh, confess what scripture teaches, and uh, where the scripture stops, I hold the principle of 1 Corinthians 4, 6, which says, do not go beyond what is written. And so while the uh, Father is clearly identified as Yahweh, and the Son is identified as Yahweh, uh, for example, the application there in uh, Romans 10, whoever calls upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Uh, the application of Psalm 102 in Hebrews 1, clearly the Son is identified as Lord. The angel of the Lord is identified as Lord in Zechariah chapter 3 and elsewhere. Uh, and the Spirit is certainly identified as Yahweh as well. If that's true throughout the Old Testament, at least he is the Spirit of Yahweh. So clearly uh, there's a connection there. And yet the Bible says very clearly that uh, here, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. That is Yahweh is one. Uh, admittedly, there are about a dozen ways of rendering the Shema, uh, and so I would say there's one. However, given that Paul uh, gives a Christian definition to the Shema in 1 Corinthians 8, 6, and includes a consideration of the creative act, uh, there is one God the Father, and notice that Carlos before just quoted that part and left out the rest, uh, one God the Father, from whom are all things, and and uh, from whom we exist, and one Lord Jesus Christ. Lord there is the Septuagintal rendering of Yahweh. One Lord Jesus Christ, through whom are all things. And the top onto there, all things, clearly is a, is a reference to creation. That's how it's used throughout the New Testament. All things includes, I, obviously, everything, not merely uh, spiritual items. And so that would be my question. Um, you know, for example, the Bible says, uh, or my answer rather, the Bible says that a husband and wife, you know, become one flesh. Well, I'm here, my wife's next door. Are we really one flesh? Well, the Bible says we are. And so I have to say, yeah, we're two different people. Certainly we're two fleshes, but we're one in some way. And so that's, you know, that's kind of where I, I leave that. 
if I may ask you a question before answering, do you hold to uh, three who's in one what? Yeah, um, so that is a, a phrase that is a catechetical tool, uh, usually for lay people. Um, it was popularized by uh, Hank Hanegraaff. And I think that could be helpful to teach people to uh, distinguish what a being is from what a person is, what from what ontology is compared to personhood. Uh, but I don't think that's a rigorous characterization of God. I don't think it's definitive. I think it's analogous language that has limits. All analogies when it comes to God have limits. And so uh, I think it's helpful in so far as it goes, but I don't think it's right. A, you know. Thank you for clarifying. The reason we ask this question, this is for the benefit of our audience, is because Trinitarians um, say that there is one God, and this is the being, the essence, right? And there are three persons in this one God. The reason we ask this question is because Yahweh, which is a divine name by uh, definition, a person, is typically the Father, right? And then there are so-called Yahweh texts applied to Jesus. Uh, I heard a, a recent debate, Mark 1, 3, I believe, uh, make straight the way, the way of the Lord. And then that's a Yahweh text applied to the Messiah. True. So people get confused because now we have, it sounds like two Yahwehs. The Father is Yahweh. Jesus is Yahweh. And then there's an added confusion to us non-Trinitarians because then they say nowadays... And I believe this is a recent phenomenon. I haven't encountered this in the patristics or scholarship of Trinitarianism. But now the apologists are saying, oh, but there is one Yahweh. Well, here's the problem. That's three X's equals one X. In other words, three Yahweh's equals one Yahweh. Plainly logical. If you know a little bit of philosophy, you know, that, that's, that, that cannot be. That's why we ask these questions just for the benefit of our audience. And that's why this, the answer here you just heard goes beyond the three who's in one what. Because now we don't have three who's in one what. Now you have three who's in one who, according to scripture. God is never a what in scripture. Uh, actually, scripture identifies God, just God, Elohim, Yahweh, right, as a person, a single soul sometimes, a spirit, and so on. You know, it talks about, about uh, seeing the face of God, the prosopon. It, that's uh, the Greek for person, really, literally. So God is always a person. God is never a being or an essence or something impersonal in Scripture. But according to Orthodox Trinitarianism, they, they turned the one God, what we call the one God, into this substance this, uh, as my wife calls it, God stuff. And there are three persons sharing of that one God. That's why we ask this question, not, not to belabor the point, but just clarifying. <laughs> Which one of you is the Trinitarian? Carlos is not a Trinitarian, and Michael is the Trinitarian, just for the record. So, uh, Michael, the Messiah is Wait, wait, the... hold what? on now. I came across as a Trinitarian? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, Michael, I'm not... I think you won, Michael. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. So here, this question. The Messiah is called the priest of the greatest. How is it possible to be simultaneously called God? Uh, yeah, well, Jesus is certainly the great high priest. Um, uh, but again, he is incarnate. He is the mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. Or as Sir Buzzard says, uh, the man Messiah Jesus, right? Because we got to say Messiah instead of Christ for some reason. Um, obviously, you can attribute human things to Christ. You know, this goes along with the same lines of Carlos's argument in the beginning here. Well, God can't die. Jesus died. Therefore, Jesus is God. Not only does that assume Unitarianism, uh, but it also assumes a lack of an incarnation. When we say that God died, what we mean is that God in human flesh died a human death and uh, was conscious thereafter because he resurrected himself, according to John 3. I will raise up this temple. Uh, and so clearly he can be the high priest and he can also be the mediator and he can also be the creator of all things because he's incarnate. Right. So we celebrate Christmas for a reason. Uh, and that reason is that God uh, is with us in Christ. He is God 
uh, in flesh. He is uh, Emmanuel. Uh, and that's what it means when it says in like, 1 Timothy 3 uh, that he was manifest in the flesh, meaning revealed in flesh. That's the verb phanerao. It's the verb from which we get like, I don't know, phantom. Uh, he was manifest in the flesh just in the same way that uh, our salvation was manifest along with him. And so I think you can attribute uh, finite characteristics. I mean, this this is why we say, I mean, I'm a Reformed Protestant. We say very clearly uh, that Mary is the mother of God. And by that, we do not mean that Mary is due some kind of idolatrous exaltation, like within the Roman Catholic communion. By that, we mean Jesus is God and Mary is his mother, meaning that he is also a human being, right? So it's a Christological claim, not so much uh, with regard to Mary. Uh, but anyway. Carlos, before Sorry, you answer, Michael, do you mind if I ask a question in regards to what you said about Mary, the mother of God? Sure. I've just heard from other Trinitarians say that uh, Mary changed God's diapers. Um, would you say something like that, or how would you respond to that? I mean, there's a lot of things people bring up with that, and yeah. Uh, so, um, so Jesus is my Lord. Um, when the Bible talks about in the Decalogue of not blaspheming and being respectful and reverent to God, I take that to apply to Jesus. And so uh, I could see why somebody would say that in order to emphasize his humanity. Uh, but that seems to me to border on the blasphemous. Uh, I don't think it's untrue. Uh, you know, I had a Muslim apologist say, well, you believe your God went to the bathroom <laughs> as if that's a defeater. Well, yeah, because he's an authentic human being. This is how much our God loves us, that he was willing to subject himself to our existence. God is no longer a distant reality. Uh, he actually became one of us to redeem us from sin, uh, to achieve the redemption that we could not achieve on our own. So, yeah. Well, thank you. It was a Trinitarian who said that. So that's why I appreciate your answer, because I, I agree that it seemed to be a little bit disrespectful. Just to be clear, um, your, your denomination holds to the Theotokos, did you say? Uh, my Sorry, denomination... I don't know. I, I, I think there's a multiplicity of views within the Southern Baptist Convention. Do you uh, personally hold to the Mother of God title? Yeah, I do, of course. Yeah, I think it's a Christological title. So, yeah, I would agree with the, you know, I consider myself a Catholic in the sense of Catholicos in the historic uh, Catholic Church, not the Roman Communion. But, of course, yeah, I would agree. I'm a Reformed, so... Um, so I'm creedal and I hold to uh, a, a historic expression. Oh, thank you. I didn't know that. That's that's very clarifying for me. I didn't know. Pro uh, well, you're still a Protestant or are you? Yeah. So when we talk about Catholicity, we're using that term in, in the patristic sense. So uh, Catholicos is a word that means general or universal. And so when we talk about being Catholic, as in the Apostles' Creed, we're not talking about the Roman Catholic communion. Uh, we're talking about the one holy universal church that exists anywhere that God's people do. And so uh, I don't, you know, I don't say, yeah, you know, um, Christianity began when the Baptists began, you know, <laughs> I, don't, I don't hold that view. Uh, I think it's a historic faith. So Thank you. Thank you. Uh, just quickly on this. Uh, uh, is it a question? Yeah. Uh, these were the precarious waters of the early nascent uh, Protestant slash Catholic you know, orthodox system that they had to travel. And that was, uh, you know, things like Nestorianism, Docetism. Uh, Michael mentioned, you know, scripture talks about the Christ manifesting or the Son manifesting in the flesh and so on. So that sort of language lent itself to systems like Docetism, for example, where, okay, so God, I'm not, I'm not accusing you, by the way, of that. Uh, that um, you know he uh, he seemed to be human, but he he really really wasn't. You know some scriptures sound a bit weird. So these are the wa the precarious waters of uh, all this. You know the the historical precedent. I think it's easier just to keep it you know just uh, harmoniously biblical, if you will, and take everything uh, uh, as a summation of things. What the rabbis said about the Messiah coming, what the Old Testament says about him. And uh, what the New Testament shows that, again, the son, the son of God, not the son of God as a human being, as a man, but the son of God originated in the womb and so on. And he becomes our high priest.